I have 20 minutes with you, and I wanted to go through it um, about education, and I want to talk about education pretty deeply. So first, for a moment, pretend I'm your teacher. Um, pretend that I just gave you a poetry assignment, and you are writing a poem, and you're in the flow. You're in the zone, you're really happy, words are coming out, they're good words, you're erasing a little bit, you're moving around, you're in the flow, and then the bell rings. So what does everybody in this room know is going to happen right now? I'm going to put down my pen and I'm going to go to math class, right? So what, what lesson did we just teach you? What is the lesson we just taught you? With Nobody said this lesson out loud. Nobody spoke this lesson to you. Nobody said the big metronome that runs this place is vastly more important than your passion, your flow, your interest in anything. You need to go to math class. And if you don't, you're kind of a troublemaker, okay? So hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it. Just hold that thought. Um, first, a couple things. One, I, I'm really happy to meet you. Yesterday was really fun. I'm glad I wasn't speaking yesterday because now I know many of you in the audience, and I've heard a bit about uh, you know, how you're going about doing what you're doing. I have a couple small apologies. Um, I'm going to talk from a US perspective just because that's where I come from. I think a lot of these issues are international, and I hope you will project onto what I'm saying, oh, right, we do that too, or oh, no, 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 we solved that a long time ago, because I know that, that Denmark is really progressive in a whole lot of interesting ways. So I'm going to really give you a, a US perspective, and I'm going to be kind of blunt. I'm going to just sort of tell it the way I think it, it, it is happening, so that we can set a baseline, because all too often I think we talk about education, and we don't aspire to enough because we don't understand the roots of the problem are really deep. And it's not just that we need to fix schools, we may need to break schools and rethink something uh, entirely different about education. So I'm going to draw a distinction between inside and outside of school. And just to be a little clearer, um, we have school, and it's called the compulsory education system for a reason, because you can be compelled to go. Then there's out of school, which is sort of the growing up process, and then we have the real world over here. And what we do is we deny kids from being in the real world for a while. We put them in this little petri dish called school, partly because we want to protect them, we want to shelter them from real world, partly because there's a hundred different reasons. But school is in a really strange way separate from real life, which means it's separate from having any consequence on real life. And, it, you know, watch your kid before they start going to school. When they're three, four, five years old, think of everything they've learned already without having gone to school, right? A language, how to play mom off against dad, how to, you know, how to negotiate truce over toys with the, with the neighbors or the siblings. It's an intense, really deep stuff that a, that a child has learned by age five. And then we send them off to this institution that's separate from life. It's very strange. So... Here on the left is school and the compulsory education system, and my little circles here are the innermost part of it is school. Then outside there's this weird area where um, there's something called homeschool, and in the U.S., homeschool, the, the phrase, has been tainted with conservative religious folks who, who decided that school was too secular for them, so they took their kids out of school and they're teaching at home. That turns out not to be the majority these days. A lot of people are homeschooling, but I'm going to draw a distinction here between homeschool and unschool. Who's heard of unschooling before? Nobody. Rockin'. <laughs> this is great. Okay. So homeschool is a lot like school, except you're at home. A parent or maybe a tutor shows up. You have a curriculum. You have lessons. You have homework. You're basically trying to figure out, you know, you're teaching your children something. Uh, they just happen to not be in school. They may still pass tests that the school gives them. The curriculum may come from some third party. Unschooling is way over here. In fact, there's something called sort of radical unschooling, which is completely child-led learning. And here the idea is that children are naturally born curious and pretty good, and they just want to learn how the world works, which if you observe any small child, that's what they do. They walk in like, why? Why? You know, you answer the question, why? Again. That children really want to figure out how the world works, and they'd like to make a contribution. So unschooling is about letting the children lead, and it's about letting go of the need to have a, a program or a curriculum or a thing they're going to learn today. And I, did a fun, I, I do these um, now bi-monthly uh, podcasts, and about two years ago I had a great one on, on uh, unschooling. And in the middle of it, my partner in crime in these things asks, but, you know, you really have to have some kind of agenda when you go out with your kids, right? And one of the unschoolers said, well, no, not really. 
And so then I asked, so what is de-schooling, which is another term? And he said, well, sometimes kids want to unschool who've been in school, but they have to go through a program sort of of detox. So we call this de-schooling. <laughs> and, th and then he said something that I will always remember. He said, de-schooling is a process of healing their curiosity. Because, as I'm about to describe to you, the school system that we all went through, I went to normal schools. I'm a product of the school system. Um, and somehow my curiosity stayed intact. I'm, a, I'm an insanely curious person, much to my detriment. So uh, off on the right side of the spectrum is the outside world, the real world, where there's learning. And I no longer believe that there's teaching. There's no teaching, there's just learning. Now, if somebody can try to teach you, uh, and coaching and mentoring and other kinds of, of leadership and advice are really insanely important. But there's no teaching. And there's a dif difference between a capital T teacher and a small T teacher. The capital T teacher is one you must listen to or you will be punished. A small T teacher is one whom you have decided to, to build a relationship with as your, as your coach or mentor. So out in the real world, we have informal learning. And I, would, I will tell you that where we're going, learning is just going to be learning at whatever age. The process is going to be really similar. It's not going to be all subdivided up into different little pieces. It's, it's just learning. And what we need to figure out is, from all the good stuff that's on the table today, what does a fantastic learning environment look like for all of us? At any age, mixing ages together, for example. That could be the subject of a two-hour talk, which is not what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to race quickly through some of the dysfunctions of the school system. You've heard these all. I'm going to recap them really quickly, just because um, partly it's kind of fun in this sort of uh, schadenfreude kind of way, um, partly just to point out how bad the thing is. So some of the symptoms are, here's one of many test results in the US. They're very, very concerned that our children are not learning science and math and technology. And we're turning out dumber kids and dumber kids and dumber kids. Uh, we're turning them out in schools that require metal detectors, where there's all sorts of bullying and, and, and all sorts of issues are running out of control. There's violence in the school. And once you make it through the entire long fish ladder of the educational system, most of our kids are leaving school with a huge amount of debt from a college they maybe didn't really need to go to. But in our system, the dream, the American dream, is everybody must have college degree or you can't get good job. And then you leave with debt, which you normally can't pay off. And these days, the kids who are graduating aren't finding that many jobs. And by the way, the good paying jobs seem to be vanishing. A lot of stuff is being automated, outsourced, et cetera. So it's kind of a weird situation. You could describe this as a crisis. And for anybody who was in our group yesterday, we drew this in our, in our group yesterday. So what we have in our school system is low morale, there's really not a lot of money with the budget crisis and the, especially the financial crisis of 2008. The can has been kicked all the way down to the local level and we have trashed the curriculum. We have thrown away art, we have thrown away music. Uh, parents are chipping in to do everything they can, which in a weird way is a good thing because they're involved again. But uh, it's just really a mess. There's low morale, scores are falling, and we're turning out uneducated people. The basics, they can't read or write. And what's really weird is that the fundamentals of reading, or, of, of reading or mathematics take about 100 hours to learn, not more than 100 contact hours. There's only one variable that matters, and only one. The child has to want to. And the moment the child wants to, 100 hours later, they're pretty proficient. And if they don't want to, you can pound them on the head as long as you want, and it may never penetrate. And that's what we're getting, is a system that is designed to try to pound things into people and never really waits for that moment when somebody's actually like, genuinely curious and interested. So um, what do we fear? We fear that we're becoming uncompetitive as a nation. We also we have this fear of, of, of alternative systems just won't scale. And if we don't have this system, everything will simply fall into chaos. And behind everything, is, I think, is a fear of chaos. What we wind up is a system we call cells, like you know, prison cells and bells, the cells and bells system. And the little example I gave you at the beginning, when I said, pretend you're in my poetry class, what was the real lesson we just taught you, comes from this guy, John Taylor Gatto. And he talks about it as the hidden curriculum of school. And I don't have enough time to go deep into it, but if you want to read about these different things that are actually what we're teaching you in school, you have no privacy. You're going to be evaluated by people outside of this school. I have dictatorial powers in class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Read The Sixth Lesson School Teacher, which is, which is a short essay he wrote 20 years ago. If you really want to get mad and understand the underpinnings of, this, of the American school system, at least, which has been copied in many places, read The Underground History of American Education, which is available for free on his website. 
So what we're teaching with this system really is obedience, conformity, hierarchy, and dependency. This, is, this system is designed not to turn people out who have a lot of initiative curiosity and know about teamwork, but we're going to ask them to do that later, right? Because in, innovation is the big thing. We're going to ask people to collaborate and be innovative, but the system is designed to, for the opposite. Now, there are tons of exceptions now. People are experimenting with all sorts of things in school, which is where I'm going next. But before I do that, I just want to give you a little history. Why the hell did we end up with this sort of bad design, right? Well, in America, for example, we used to have thousands upon thousands of little one-room schoolhouses. This is a picture of one in Minnesota. And mixed ages, these kids would be sent over there to do math, and Bobby would tutor Susie, who was much younger, et cetera, et cetera. It really worked. We were turning out educated people. When de Tocqueville comes to America and, and then writes uh, Democracy in America, he goes back and he says, these Americans are really educated. I went out to the backwoods and I found somebody who had shelves and books and was reading in the middle of the backwoods of Tennessee. I didn't expect that. Well, then when we started to get this industrial revolution hitting, we needed many more of these people, and they needed to be pretty docile because it's kind of boring to sit for 12 hours and do this. And they also needed to be good at this. They needed to be shoppers, future shoppers. So what we did is our, our best educators went to Germany and, and imported a system designed for this guy, Otto von Bismarck, in Prussia. Now, he was having trouble with the Junkers, who were like the wealthy landed class. And in order to outweigh the Junkers, he needed a lot of these people to be very well-trained and very obedient. So they developed the Prussian military school system, which we then imported wholesale into the US. So we imitate that the, 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 this sort of whole notion that kids are divided into one-year one year ranks, et cetera, et cetera. We basically applied a military industrial model to education and expected this to really work. It's kind of weird when you look at the history of it. Because we wanted something that would scale and we wanted some degree of quality control, but we used this sort of military engineering managerial way of doing it, which was actually entirely the wrong way of doing it. So, We've created artificial scarcity over and over and over throughout the school system. Um, for example, and there's a whole presentation that you can go see on my website or on YouTube. It's called uh, Seeing Abundantly uh, in Education. And I'm talking a lot about abundance versus scarcity. And when you look at education, so we separate the kids into one-year one year grade levels. So the sixth graders want to be seventh graders and hate the fifth graders. They never really interact, right? What a huge loss to humanity, because the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody who's just two steps behind you. Then it, that really drives it into your head. So we're losing that. Then we separate them into classes. We separate them into rows and tables like you. We evaluate them independently. The, kid who, the, the person who knows the most about how good you are at math is sitting right next to you. We're never going to ask him. We don't care. We're not interested, right? And the person who might be able to help you most is right there. And then a teacher with a particular kind of degree who isn't being paid very well is going to show up and teach you from a limited set of books because the curriculum has been controlled now. Ask me later about the Texas school board. So half of the, half of the public schools in the United States of America follow the recommendations of the Texas school board, which once every five years rotates through the five major subjects, science, math, history, English, whatever. And Macmillan, Pearson, all the big textbook publishers know this. They know they have one chance every five years to show up and sell either multiple million books or close to zero. And they'll do anything. They'll bend over backwards. And the, the, the political makeup of the Texas school board, 15 members, 10 of them are conservative, five of them are liberal. Who figured this out 20 years ago? Conservatives. So, so the notion that you can't bring texts and you can't bring books into a classroom, that they're prohibited, blows my mind. So we're creating scarcity there. We're creating scarcity because we think we need school rooms with budgets, with this, with that. It's over and over again, um, we have scarcity when instead, anybody could be a teacher about something. The cashier at Starbucks can show you how to make change. You could ask, you could connect people. There's abundance all over the place that um, you can go watch this video that I, I did um, if you want to learn more about. So let me shift now. Let me go uh, to, the, to the brighter side. And the brighter side is still partly cloudy. It's not the brightest thing at all, because I want to differentiate here between innovations that are happening in school, where people are trying to fix this very broken thing, which is still congenitally deformed. Because those hidden lessons that I told you about don't go away, even when you have brilliant new technology and great new things happening inside the school. So one set of innovations are these charter schools. There's the KIPP knowledges, or I've in, in fact forgotten what KIPP stands for, but rocket ship education, the Harlem Village Academies. There's a bunch of interesting projects that are getting a ton of attention. 
There are all, Finland is getting a lot of attention because it's paid a lot, a, a lot of uh, money and time and, and status for teachers. They've decided that, that teaching is really important and it's having very good effects on their, on their kinds of learning. Um, there's a little school called Brightworks that's near where I am that's in an old mayonnaise factory in San Francisco. Uh, the the uh, guy who started it, uh, Gaber Tully, he wrote a book titled something like 52 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Kids Do. And it's all about making, experimenting. So, so Jake's talk about making is perfectly, is really perfect energy to flow into where I'm going here, which is positive. Um, Project-based learning is very popular, which is to take one thing and go deep into it. We're going to learn all about how to make a raft and float it across the Pacific, whatever it might be. Um, you could learn a tremendous amount about the world just by looking at a cup of coffee for a year. You could study a cup of coffee and learn math, uh, fluid dynamics, language, uh, chemistry, history, lots of history, language, uh, geography, everything is in a cup of coffee. Khan Academy has gotten insanely famous. Here's a screenshot of one of his early, you know, early lessons on fraction action. Um, the Khan Academy has led to something called the flipped classroom. Who has heard of the flipped classroom? Only a few of you, maybe 10%. Um, so what's happening is schools are saying, hey, if this guy, Khan, has gone and already recorded all the math curriculum and the, you know, a lot of the science curriculum and more, why don't we have the kids do what they're good at? It's watch TV at home. So kids, go watch the lesson, the lecture at home, and let's do the homework together in class. So the flipped classroom says, you guys go listen to the lecture. I'm not going to come in and you know, talk about it. And it, what's cool is that it doesn't have to be Sal Khan who gives the lecture. There could be thousands of options for somebody teaching the same particular module on whatever subject you want, right? If Sal Khan, one guy as a hobby, over three years by himself, can create thousands of videos and cover the entire math curriculum, and then a lot of other areas going into French history, going into the, the GREs and the SATs and a whole bunch of other stuff, imagine if a lot of us decided to do that, right? And it cost him zippity do it cost him his time because there's this thing called YouTube which is hosting all his videos for free what he needed money for later was to begin to build an architecture behind it for teachers for this for that and I'm a little leery of what they're starting to build because it's very much the teacher behind the curtain trying to figure out who which student do I help now in class it's not the students trying to figure out who else could they help in class it's everybody proceeding at their own pace. It, it still mirrors a lot of the old things. So for me, Khan is not panacea. Khan is a really good marker of what's possible. So um, I won't even begin to be able to describe to you the kinds of resources that are available online now, which were called open educational resources. Now it's just called everything. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more, but there's this vast trove of beautiful things. Now, just outside school are some interesting things like DIYU by Tanya, uh, Anya Kamenetz, a recent book that says, don't go to university, make your own university. And then this guy, Peter Thiel, who is a, a notoriously smart investor in Silicon Valley, um, and uh, if you watch the movie The Social Network about Facebook, there's an actor playing Peter Thiel because he was one of the original investors in Facebook. And he has decided to award $100,000 over two years to students who have been accepted to some of these major colleges and agree not to go to school. He will fund them $100,000 to go start a business. And he figures they're going to learn an awful lot from that. So this is a picture of the initial squad of Thiel fellows. That's interesting. Um, but then way outside in the real world, there's a couple big things going on. One, and these are maybe obvious to you, but some of them are, are uh, maybe less obvious. So we're almost all connected now. We can, we can find people. We can, we can send emails to just about anybody. Um, every PC, this thing right here, is a typewriter, a telephone, uh, a, a game arcade machine, a travel agent. Uh, it's incredible. These little devices, or the iPads or whatever else, can do all these things that used to cost an awful lot of money to do. We're calling this the dematerialization of society, in that, in that these little flat panel devices that have just a, a, you know, a touch screen on them that couldn't be anything. You can put anything on them. And then there's a feature of the internet that I love that doesn't get that much play. I call it persistence. And what I mean is, when you put things in the internet, they stay there. Now, that was not true before. It used to be that when you put things anywhere, there was no place to put them. Like, you know, uh, we would, I would call Lori, and then we would talk, and then we would hang up, and then there'd be nothing left of the phone call. And if you missed the program at 6 o'clock, you missed the program until we got VCRs and tapes, and then we could record it, and that was really cumbersome. 
Now, you put things out there, and you can turn around and go around about your day, and they stay there. This is brand new. Through all of human history, the reason I'm showing you a cave painting from Chauvet, the Chauvet Caves, is that through all of history, back into prehistory, it has never been possible for humans to leave things out there for others. So the connectivity, the power, that's probably obvious. This little feature, persistence, I think is much less obvious and maybe three times as important. I'm making up the number three. Um, by the way, 68% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Um, <laughs> So persistence is this insanely important feature of the web that is changing our lives profoundly and changes all the dynamics and all the power structures of what's going on. So I don't have time, but I could tell you about open content, garage biology, the maker movement, and it's lovely that Jake was talking about make, make, make. He didn't talk much about the maker fair and maker movement, which is growing enormously. There's a, there's a little company called Tech Shop that started in California and is now opening tech shops in different cities. I got a tour of the downtown San Francisco tech shop about a year ago, and I spent all evening walking around looking at these lathes, machining tools, computer uh, control devices, laser cutters. There was a water pressure cutter in the back the size of a, of a minivan. Um, I'm walking around the whole evening going, I wish I was 12 again. Please make me 12. If you've watched videos online about quad rotor drones flying around in formation taking pictures or balloon, you know, balloon photography or what, really? Make me a kid again. And I can learn geography, physics, all those things from any of these things you want. It's all just out there. However, technology is not the answer. So when somebody shows up in school and says, look, we've got this great new technology, we're going to apply it to your kids, your little BS alarm should be like lighting up. And you should think very, very carefully, because what we really want is agency. And I didn't realize this was the, the important word for me until recently I heard a woman giving a talk. And she's from uh, New Zealand, which means she's very entertaining. So I'm, we're all kind of laughing. And halfway through the talk, she says, what we really want is for kids to have, again, a sense of agency. Now, we talk about power a lot. We talk about consumer power, which to me is an oxymoron. The word consumer is what started me down this path. I hate the word consumer. Um, so agency means you, the permission, the ability to do something, to act on something. And what's happened is we have removed the sense of agency from everybody. Not on purpose, just kind of happened over the last couple hundred years. I'll go into this a tiny bit more in the couple minutes I have left. But what we want is this sense of agency and this sense of permission that it's okay to go out and change your world. It's okay to use these tools to make a difference. Because kids, in many cases, don't feel they have permission. The most important thing they can feel is like the permission that Jake had to just go try to build a treehouse and put a board on the tree and then see what happens. Now, what we really want is, so could I call up a couple friends who've built tree houses before and we could learn faster, better together? That's interesting, and we're just starting to get to that place in history. So we need to heal kids' curiosity to do this. Um, so in the big picture to me, um, as I said, the word consumer really started me down this path, and I've discovered that we have consumerized every sector of society, not just consumer packaged goods, but education, religion, Sports, government, healthcare, justice, all is like packages of cereal on the shelf. The reason that Obama and Romney need a lot of money right now is because they're going to pay television stations an awful lot of money to run ads to try to tell us that we want to vote for them. And they're going to run the ads and they're, they're, they're going to study the ads just like you would for cereal. They're going to run focus groups. They're going to figure out which words do we say. It's not about authentic communication and about real policy and about real debate and deliberation. It's really about consumerization of everything. And what consumerization does is it separates us from each other because you're going to be an individual by buying Nikes, not Puma, et cetera, et cetera. But second, and again, more, I think, the more hidden agenda is it removes from us this sense of agency, the responsibility for the task at hand. So when you're in the school system, buried in the educational system, doing what they tell you to do, learning dependency, learning obedience, you're losing that sense of agency. And it's, it's a hidden curriculum, it's very subtle, and it happens to you just by volunteering and going in there. And the best thing you can do is help your kid preserve that sense of agency and curiosity. Because the system is designed mostly to stamp it out. So I talked about dematerialization. De everything's connected to everything. We're having decentralization of everything. The cost of creating things has fallen to almost zero. 
The cost, textbooks in colleges are now costing $200, $250 for one textbook for one class for one semester. $250. It's insane. It's a dead end. It's a Britannica kind of, kind of business, right? They're going to be out of business really soon. And we have all this stuff that could be curriculum with a small c out in the real world. And if we start connecting people to meaning, I think that's the big, that's the big win. So, a small opening as we head toward a broader discussion about the opportunities in education. There's all sorts of opportunities. Once you put your brain over this little imaginary line and imagine that lots of people are self-educating at any age, that they can cross age barriers, that they can ask experts, that there's meaningful projects out in the world to do, then you get to questions like, oh, so what does my modern portfolio look like? What does it look like, you know, my CV, the old school way of telling people what you've done? is a list of, of your degrees and your whatever. What does my modern portfolio look like so that you know who I am and, and what communities I'm part of and why I'm credible and what I know how to do? Um, how do I find thinking partners? How do I find different groups of people to learn with? That's a really wonderful problem to have. Give me that problem instead of how do I stop bullying in schools? How do we relearn peer review? How do we figure out who's good at something, certification? Right now, schools are just proxies. We, you know, employers trust schools in that if you went to Yale, you're probably this smart and you probably jumped all the hoops properly and maybe we can employ you and, and so forth. But half the big employers in the country have remedial classes. They have to teach their, their new hires English, math, basics. They're, 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 it's really pretty grim out there. Um, and then th I think there's an enormously large business in tutoring, coaching, mentoring, other kinds of relationships. It's going to be huge, much bigger than we have today. If I wanted to learn to speak Mandarin tomorrow, there should be 15 different options. If I wanted to learn to make a bicycle, if I wanted to learn uh, better geography, whatever, that's a place where we might actually have some employment. Some of this will be done for no money as volunteerism or as open content, but some of them will be done for pay. And that works great. There's a, in South Korea, this is probably an anomaly, but in South Korea, there's a woman named the English Queen. And she teaches English online to South Koreans, a desirable thing to learn for South Koreans. She makes seven or eight million dollars a year teaching English in South Korea. Interesting. You know, there's, there's, there's an opening there. So, <laughs> so I want to encourage you to think really broadly and deeply about the educational system and not to take it for granted. Um, listen to your instincts and listen to your children. When they ask you these questions, th these why questions, they're mostly right because they get how the energy should be flowing. They get what should be happening. When you see an educational venture that is expensive and locks up the intellectual property and doesn't let you make it part of your portfolio later in life and use it as a tool forever, doubt it. Go for something open. Go for something different. So this all just as a way of starting our discussion, and I thank you very much.